screen, but let me just encourage folks to um, maybe put in the chat to everyone who you are, where you're from, um, as people get started today, just so we can sort of see who all is here um, and others can see who is here. And with that, um, Kristen, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for joining everyone. Um, we are really excited to have a workshop um, outside of our regular Green Step Cities workshop series that tend to follow more of the school year time. Um, but this one was very timely and very exciting topic. I'm glad to see the turnout that we um, have for this particular topic and we have some great presenters today. So thank you for joining. We will be recording um, and I think that we can share PowerPoint slides and contact information with you afterwards. But if you have any questions as we're going through, please don't hesitate to um, um, use the chat box um, at all, you know, during today. Um, so today's topics are largely around planning um, and engagement. And so I wanted to put in the chat box here as all of the things are coming in. We'll see if this works. So you'll find more resources on the Green Step Cities best practice um, pages related to best practice number six, 24, and 29. And so I'm gonna try to put those links in here for you. There they are. Um, if you want more information or resources, that's a good place to start. For any of you that aren't familiar with Green Step Cities or aren't currently participating, if you have any questions about what the program is or how we support communities across the state, um, you can please reach out to me and I'd be happy to chat with you more about that. And with that, I'll let Lissa talk a little bit more specifically about um, Chris's work, I think. <laughs> uh, Kristen, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I, I think for folks who are not familiar with Green Step, this will give you a, a pretty good starting sense of some of the different elements of the Green Step work. And, I, and I'll say on behalf of CERTS, I'm Lisa Polish and I work with the Clean Energy Resource Teams or CERTS. Um, we're super excited to do this. And, and Kristen said that today's session is really focused on planning. And I, <laughs> I was taking some notes on a story that Chris Meyer wrote up that was sort of a prelude to this session today. And one of the things that Chris said as she was talking with all of the speakers that you'll hear from is, they're just doing such great stuff and I feel like more people should know about it. <laughs> and I, I think I'll describe planning as sort of the unsung hero of how local government work really happens and how it moves forward. And it's, it's one of those really essential elements um, for getting things done. And I think what's really interesting is we're going to hear today from four different speakers from four different places who really talk about the different ways that it gets done. It's not the same process everywhere and people have different sorts of approaches. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from another in terms of how to, how to approach it, how we're thinking about timeframes, how we're thinking about engagement, how we bring new people into that process. Um, you know, I think sometimes uh, we would all wish that people paid more attention to <laughs> what was happening um, in city government, right? We're like, oh, please respond, please respond. Um, but I think we're gonna hear from some speakers today about the different processes that they've engaged in to make that happen. Um, we're excited to kick this off and I'll say Chris Meyer is our Southeast CERT coordinator and has been doing a fantastic job of helping hold up and make these connections. But we wanted to make sure that this was available statewide. And we do have people joining us today from Northwest Minnesota and Central Minnesota and across the Metro and into Northeast and Southwest. Um, it's great because this is the topic that is relevant all over the state. And that's why we wanted to have this as a Green Step session so that everybody could have access to this. And so we appreciate all of you joining us and very much appreciate all of our speakers. And Chris, how about I just pass it over to you to start doing introductions and we'll get started. Super, thank oh, you so much. Sorry, Chris, one more thing. Friends, Kristen mentioned this and Chris and I were chatting about it in the background, but as you have questions, please just put them in the chat and the chat will come to everyone, but we'll be trying to monitor that chat as we go so that when we get to the Q&A, when we start to see some common themes, we'll bring those forward to the speakers. Okay, super, thanks. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, thank you very much for all of that. Uh, I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator and our regions mirror those of the University of Minnesota Extension. And so one of my jobs is to get to meet people across the region and find out what things they're doing and want to do 
and it is truly the most inspirational part of my job because I get to learn about the really tremendous things that communities are doing to improve their quality of life, save money, save energy, and you know, really be good to the planet. So it's very exciting. Our first speaker today is going to be David Wanberg. And David has been the city planner for the city of Faribault for about six years. He also has degrees in architecture and regional and community planning. And he's worked in private firms in both of those areas. And he actually taught in both of those areas at Kansas State University. More recently, uh, he taught some sustainability classes at the University of Minnesota at the Humphrey School. He's incredibly knowledgeable and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him on several different initiatives uh, while he's been in Faribault. And uh, David is gonna talk to us a little bit about how he has uh, incorporated sustainability into their planning process in Faribault. And the, I hope share some of the things he's done to um, change the change kind of the culture, educate to bring sustainability into the culture of the city. Thank you very much, um, Chris. So let me go ahead and start my um, presentation here from the beginning. Um, so I'm excited to be able to share with you some of our experiences and learn what you're doing in your communities as well. As I look back at Faribault five years ago and where we're at today, I think we've made a lot of progress, but we actually have a long way to go. And um, we're not a model city in terms of sustainability or resilience, but I am excited to share with you some of the successes that we've had, um, some of the challenges that we've faced and continue to face, as well as some of the lessons um, that we've learned throughout this. And if I could just hit on some of the lessons right up front, because this is what I'll talk about over the next few minutes. I really do think it's important to have a uh, promote a shared awareness and understanding throughout the entire community. Having the, the council, elected officials, the appointed boards and officials, as well as residents throughout the city, the businesses and so on, have a shared un understanding of why we're talking about sustainability, what we can do together and so on. So that's really, really important. Second, I would say, we really rely on partnering, collaborating, and empowering others to do a lot of work. There is no way we could get work done in the city without those partnerships and collaborations and empowerment to others on that. And to that extent, I would say wherever you can recruit champions that can come and participate, and it's not just led from city staff, but you, you get others uh, participating in this and really championing uh, the sustainability cause, I think that's really helpful. Third, I would say is promoting a shared and compelling vision. You have to be able to tell an inspiring story. There's a quote that I often use from Exubere that says, you know, if you want to build a ship, and I'm just paraphrasing, but if you want to build a ship, don't give people wooden tools and plans and tell them what to do, but really teach them or to yearn for the endless sea. You know, so if you can inspire people about things, I think the rest of it falls in line. Um, so that's really important. And the last thing I would say is, I really feel like a lot of the work we're doing, we're planting the seeds and we're nurturing them. And at times it's easy to get discouraged, like what's happening? You know, I'm working so hard and I'm not seeing anything happening, but keep persisting because things begin to happen over time and you might want it to happen quicker, but just keep persisting. All right, so I'm gonna start out and just tell you a little bit about some of the main things that we've done here. And I'm gonna be very quick about this. And I, I'll start out about five years ago, we did a uh, community vision. And, we, and the reason I bring this up is when I, I came to Faribault roughly seven years ago, and I talked to a number of people about sustainability and resilience and so on, and we got mixed responses to that. You know, not a lot of excitement over that. We started a, a community vision process about five years ago that involved a lot of people throughout the community doing meetings in the boxes, neighborhood meetings, and so on. So we had a lot of involvement in that. We specifically did not talk about things like sustainability and resilience, at least in those terms, but asked people to share what do they like about the community, what their values were, and so on. And we worked together as a community to come up with a shared vision and the, these core values. Really what people were talking about is sustainability. I mean, they're talking about the importance of the natural environment, uh, the importance of people and having equitable situations and all those kinds of things that we talk about in terms of sustainability. So we use that in our next step, which we've done in, over the last few years, which we've called Journey to 2040. 
And this is really a massive planning effort that um, we've had Perkins and Will, the consulting firm, help us with, um, where we've uh, prepared a downtown master plan, a parks, trails, and open space plan, and a comprehensive plan update. And throughout that, we referred back to this community vision and the values that we had and really began to put it in light of sustainability. And we added a number of uh, guiding principles related to sustainability, smart growth, and so on in that. I think one of the most important things that we talked about is just how all the different components of sustainability relate to each other. So often we hear the three pillars of sustainability, you know, the, the environment, the social, the economic, and we'll see them illustrated in different ways. What we decided to do on this is um, we had people really think about, because I, the economy is really an important part for a lot of people. And, you know, they'll say, well, we can't afford this, we can't afford that, you know, and it's all related to the economy. But we had people thinking about, okay, how does the economy relate to all the other aspects in the city? So we see economy as nested in with our, within our built assets. So our roads, our sewers, our waters, that sort of thing. But that's nested within our social assets, you know, that we're a welcoming community where people want to come and work and participate. There's things to do. Um, the culture of the city, they like that. And that's rooted within our human assets. We need to be able to have good health care. We need to be able, be able to have uh, education and skills to be able to support our economy and so on. And of course, all of that is nested within the na uh, natural assets or our natural resources. We can't survive as a community if we don't have a strong natural environment. So getting people to think about sustainability, they might come in through the social assets uh, door, or they might come in through the econo uh, economic door. But in reality, once they're in and they see how all these things work together, that's one of the biggest things that we had in getting people to talk about that. And so that's what makes those five, and we use five instead of three pillars, but those five sets and which I've referred to as assets really make up the sustainable community of Faribault, or what we're striving for here. And then okay, so since you have then- just about a minute left, just so you- One know. minute, okay. Sorry, and so, man. Thank you. So then what we've done is really looked at it more from a global standpoint. And we have been doing a number of things, um, how we fit into that. We're working with a lot of companies because they have strong sustainability plans. Um, we've worked with Excel Energy on um, an energy action plan, which has been amazing. Um, there's a lot of really good things that have come out of that. I'm going to, just because of time, I won't tell you those things, but a lot of good things that have come out of that. We've also done um, climate action plans. MPCA has been great about helping us uh, fund some of our climate plans. Um, so we have a, a population vulnerability assessment as well as a climate adaptation plan that we're working with Pale Blue Dot on. Um, MPCA through RETAP and Chris and Paul Meyer has helped us with um, some of the work that we did to be more energy efficient. We've done some a number of things through CERTs with seed grants that have been super helpful for us. We participated in uh, Solar Possible, and um, the city charge, city's charging ahead has been amazing. Um, we've done a lot in terms of moving our community towards electric vehicles, and we'll be in start uh, charging stations here shortly on that. We've done a number of other things. We're a green step city. We've worked with pollinators, things like prescribed grazing as it relates to sustainability and so on. We have had challenges, just like everyone, in terms of staffing, um, budget and so on. But again, I'll just come back to, I really think it's important that we have a shared awareness and understanding that we partner and collaborate with others. It's incredibly important that we have a shared and compelling vision and inspiring story and that we realize it's going to take some time. We're planting the seeds, we're nurturing, and we're persisting on it. So I'm looking forward to the discussion on um, uh, from all of you later on in the uh, presentations here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, David. Yeah. And I, I hope that you'll think up some questions that you can uh, ask David. He is incredibly knowledgeable and I've enjoyed uh, working with him and getting to know him and getting to know other folks in, in Faribault. Melissa Bartman, um, who is the coordinator, uh, the community and economic development coordinator at the city of Red Wing. She's been with Red Wing for about five years, but I think she moved into this role about a year and a half ago. 
and she has been working on um, the climate action plan for Red Wing over the past year. And um, so that is very fascinating work for me to hear about. And the city of Red Wing run an award for their citizen engagement as they did their um, development of their uh, comprehensive plan over the last number of years. And um, they uncovered some incredible statistics about the level of commitment to sustainability in their community. And it led to this uh, climate action plan, but they've taken a slightly different approach. Um, and I hope that Melissa will share some of that uh, in her presentation today. Thanks, Melissa. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today and share what Red Wing is doing in sustainability. Today, I'm gonna to briefly cover how Red Wing incorporated a climate action work plan into their long and short-term planning. So Red Wing has a long history of environmental sustainability, some of the more recent being that they established a sustainability commission to act as the formal advisory body to city council in 2008. In 2011, we joined Green Step Cities. Uh, and in 2015, the city participated in Excel's partner in energy program and created the Green Wing Energy Action Plan. Next slide, please. So all of this helped set the stage for when the city started working on its comprehensive plan back in 2017, which we call the Red Wing 2040 Community Plan. The plan focused heavily on community input and engagement, and a large effort was made to get out into the neighborhoods, host open houses, attend activities likely to attract underserved and underrepresented populations. Next slide, please. So within the plan, we have an entire chapter that is dedicated to the environment. And one of the things when we found when we were working on the plan, thanks to community surveys that were conducted during the process, is that residents strongly supported the city's efforts in mitigating climate change in our community. And so this information was incorporated and helped develop the goals and strategies in this chapter. Next slide, please. So the Red Wing 2040 plan serves as the city's comprehensive plan that all other, flow, uh, other plans flow from. So, and this was adopted in February of 2019. And so as you can see here, uh, one of the first goals listed in chapter three in the environment uh, chapter is establishing a climate action plan. And then right below that is um, uh, reducing uh, citywide emissions on or before 2040. And these goals then trickled down into the city's 2019 uh, strategic plan and within this plan, uh, City Council highlighted actions that they wanted the city to work on for the next three to five years. And again, establishing a climate action plan was designated by our council as a top priority. So with this direction from council, uh, this was then added to the Sustainability Commission's 2020 work plan. Next slide, please. So once all of that had been established, the Sustainability Commission took the lead in developing a plan they started in the fall of 2019 kind of researching um, what, what options were out there if this was something that the commission could develop themselves, um, which we quickly found out that that wasn't a possibility. Um, and so we contracted with Great Plains Institute and uh, we, um, I'm happy to say, just adopted a climate action work plan uh, just last week, our council did. Next slide. So the plan that our council adopted, it's a five-year work plan that leveraged previous work we have done, um, along with the foundational documents, uh, documents such as the Red Wing 2040 and the 2019 strategic plan. And so what this plan does is it uh, provides the, cities, the city with a series of actions that we can take to begin reducing emissions. It, uh, the plan outlines five main strategies, which covers building vehicles, renewable energy and waste, and it was really developed to help us gain momentum, demonstrate progress and prepare us for the, the years to follow. And it will now become you know, the guiding document for the city and the Sustainability Commission over the next five years. So I think that is my last slide, so I'll wrap up. So thank you everyone and I'll hand it back to Chris. Thanks, Melissa. Um, our next speaker is Beth Callistead, who is a program coordinator at the city of Northfield, where she has been for about a year and a half. Um, 
She was hired with a mission to advance their climate action plan. Um, and previous to this, Beth was uh, a, an educator with the University of Minnesota Extension in the area of leadership and civic engagement. Prior to that, uh, she was a research scientist for the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, working on air, water, uh, and food safety, um, and has held a variety of other positions uh, for nonprofits and watershed organizations um, focusing on the area of water. Um, we are very excited because Beth recently joined our Southeast Steering Committee um, and uh, she brings with her a wealth of knowledge. So I'm very excited to hear what she's going to share with us uh, about Northfield and her work on their uh, climate action plan. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, today you get the low tech version from me because I freaked out last week and said, I have to make slides. Oh my gosh. Um, no, <laughs> Chris said it's all right. Just talk. So I'm going to just talk today. Um, so hello everybody. Um, so let me, I'll start with just giving you a little bit of background. Um, this is really just about the development of Northfield's Climate Action Plan, but it started a long time before that. So Northfield's a town of around 20,000 people in southeast Minnesota. We're about 45 minutes south of the metro area. We're home to two liberal arts colleges, uh, Maltemiel, now called Post Holdings, our city hospital, our historic downtown, uh, retail businesses, arts, uh, thriving nonprofits, and very near and dear to my heart, the wild and scenic Cannon River, which you see in the picture looking neither wild nor scenic um, at that point, but it is really. <laughs> um, so the city has a long history of environmental advocacy. Um, back in the 1970s, our city motto got um, shifted a little bit from cows colleges and, cont and contentment to cows colleges and contamination. Uh, there was a group called Hatpin, which was the housewives alert to pollution in Northfield um, and many other things happening at that time. Our Environmental Quality Commission has been in place for over 25 years. Um, I had the pleasure of serving on that back in the early 2000s and I'm now the staff liaison for that board. Um, we have done various studies and work on environmental issues. And a uh, key one was in 2008, there was a mayor's energy task force that produced a report which was never adopted for reasons unknown to me. Uh, so the city adopted a strategic plan in 2018. It's a three-year strategic plan that has six priority areas, um, one of which is climate change impacts. And so um, that was a, a key um, piece to us moving forward with the climate action plan. So. The mayor appointed a Climate Action Plan Advisory Board, or KPAB as we refer to them, to work with staff and consultants on developing the plan. The KPAB group broke into six kind of focus areas. So we had energy, transportation, land use, food, water, and materials and waste. Um, the city also created my position as program coordinator to essentially do project management with the Climate Action Plan and also the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, which is one of the other six priority areas of our strategic plan because it, they're both things that um, cross multiple um, departments but didn't really have a home somewhere else. Uh, I'm currently funded on a two-year uh, temporary assignment, so to speak, with reserve funds and uh, we'll see what the 2021 budget brings. That is uh, still up for debate, but hoping to stick around a little longer. So the Climate Action Plan Advisory Board worked on doing a community survey at the very beginning um, they did some periodic community meetings and updates, and there were a, around 50 people, give or take, that helped serve on those um, kind of subgroups. We also worked with Great Plains Institute as a consultant to help us with uh, the background research, some focus groups, um, community input, and really overall writing of the plan, which, um, as Melissa alluded to, was definitely much more than a volunteer um, group probably could have managed on their own. Orange Environmental, and so then GPI did some subcontracting. Um, Orange Environmental did our building operations, city operations assessment to help us understand what our city emissions were, and that's been a really valuable piece for me. Um, and then LHB um, did uh, the kind of this wedge diagram that if you're a part of the, what is it called? RII, somebody help me out there. Regional Indicators Regional Indicators, Initiative. thank you. If you're part of that group, you've seen their wedge diagrams. Um, to help with some of our reduction scenarios. So that was great. We also, uh, so the energy subcommittee, while this 
climate action plan was being developed, we had the opportunity to apply for the partners in energy program with Excel. And so the energy subcommittee used that as their kind of planning tool, which was hugely helpful. Um, instead of adopting that as a standalone energy action plan, we just wrapped it into the climate plan. So we called it the energy subcommittee report. Um, and that has been fantastic and amazing. And I can't say enough good things about partners in energy um, in terms of helping us get stuff out. And I'm gonna be really sad when our time with them is done. Um, Cause I don't have any, I have very little um, staff help. So <laughs> they've been, they've been great. So we are, we finally finished the climate action plans about 18 months or so from start to finish. I was adopted November 5th of last year. It's a mix of mitigation and resiliency actions. Um, and it's really about a 20 year plan. Um, so it's, it's some of it's kind of high level, a lot of it's high level, but our two main goals are to be 100% carbon, have 100% carbon free electricity in the whole city by 2030. And then to be 100% carbon free by 2040 with the disclaimer that um, being Northfield, we created our own definition of carbon free, um, which basically does allow for sequestration and offsets. And yes, I know that's not right, but we're going with it. So just, <laughs> moving forward. Um, it's a very ambitious plan, I will say that. Um, and we, so we currently have about 60% of one person, me, um, as in terms of staff support. Um, our Environmental Quality Commission is now the city advisory board that is really kind of overseeing progress on it. And we kept that, those six topic area work group structures. So the Environmental Quality Commission is trying to help support community efforts um, some of the people that were on those subgroups are still working on those topics, and so they're moving that along. Um, we became a Green Step City Step 4 this year. And Beth, I'm sorry, just one minute, yep. Um, so we're working with Green Steps as a potential tracking tool. This first year is really a lot about what the city can do with our operations, so energy efficiency, renewable energy options, looking into that. Fleet study, um, Excel's got a pilot program right now, so we're getting a fleet study done at no cost. Um, so that's great. Um, we got a search grant for some solar assessment, created a sustainability page. We partnered with our Rotary Club to get two EV charging stations put in. Um, and then the next year, I'm really hoping to keep going with those energy efficiency projects, um, finish the fleet study, maybe get solar moving, maybe some building benchmarking and tracking and reporting on our progress. All that being said, we don't know what our budget is for next year. Um, and what's going on. So we're taking it a day at a time and we're going to do what we can with what we have. Um, I've got nonprofit background and, you know, we'll make it work. Uh, I will say there's a theme about the lean, mean operating machines that we're hearing here. Uh, thanks, Beth. And I will say, you know what, guys, we're all ahead of schedule, so we'll have lots of time for Q&A. So if you've thought of questions for any of the speakers, please put it in the chat and uh, we will give them a chance to respond to all of us um, at, after we're our final speaker, which is going to be Kevin Bright. Kevin is the Director for Energy and Sustainability uh, for Destination Medical Center and also for the City of Rochester. And he uh, moved to Minnesota and he's been here in Rochester for about three and a half years. Prior to that, he was a consultant and he was a sustainability coordinator at Colby College in Maine. And before that, he was part of the Green Building Services Program. He was, he was the manager, uh, a services manager at the Green Building Program Services Program Manager at, at Harvard University. He has an incredible uh, knowledge of uh, energy, and sustainability around uh, building and construction. And he has um, started a, a monthly sustainability series um, that is, has moved online. It used, used to be held at the library in Rochester and he has had an, a fabulous array of speakers uh, come and share at that meeting. And I, I would encourage anyone who's interested to reach out to him and see if they can participate or at, sit in on some of those meetings because I have learned a lot and he's had some great resources and shared a lot of incredible companies and work that's being done in the city of Rochester and in the state of Minnesota. Um, so Kevin has had this unique approach of really creating building blocks to build sustainability in the parks and trails plan and in the transportation plan and in the downtown plan and in DMC 
And it's been a, a really delightful to watch. And I have felt that he's been very masterful about the ways that he's uh, tried to promote sustainability across the community in Rochester. So he's, I think he's been a great addition to Southeastern Minnesota and the state in general. And um, so Kevin, please go ahead. Thanks for that really generous introduction, Chris. Um, I feel a little uncomfortable, but thank you. Uh, can folks see my slides okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, one thing that I wanna make clear too is there is a team of folks here that work on sustainability on a daily basis. Uh, so Cindy Steinhauser uh, leads the sustainability team, the community development director. Lauren Jensen and Sletzi are also here on the call today. I don't know if they felt compelled to join because Rochester was being talked about or what, but um, they've been super helpful and really helped advance some of our programs that we'll talk uh, for the next few minutes here. So we have a number of adopted sustainability goals here in Rochester. Um, really kind of the goal adoption around sustainability started in 2015. So the, the slide you're seeing in front of you is really kind of encompassing five years of work or so. And we'll talk a little bit more about these building blocks that Chris mentioned um, in a slide coming up. So we do have greenhouse gas reduction goals similar to other communities that talked and spoke before. And the key ones are kind of these greenhouse gas emission reductions. So um, they match the next gen energy, energy goals that the state has passed. Um, we kind of adopted the same thing here in Rochester. Um, and they are on a per capita basis. So we're trying to realize these reductions of 80% reduction by 2050. Uh, per capita as a way to kind of normalize because we're seeing some pretty significant population growth um, here in Rochester. Probably had about 20,000 people added to the community over the past 10 years. Uh, so pretty rapid growth. Uh, but good news is we are continuing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions since 2007 and largely the reductions are coming from the building sector. So uh, just buildings becoming more efficient and I think based on the footprint of some of the larger employers like Mayo Clinic, this 22% reduction is um, kind of directly tied to their uh, investment that they've made in their own facilities, um, primarily through recommissioning and LED lighting. Uh, they have given a few presentations about how they've achieved their reductions and um, we should probably highlight more of their work because I think others can learn from it. But in terms of the building blocks, this is kind of a slide that I created for today was trying to outline kind of the the major things that have happened over the past five years and how they've contributed to our sustainability planning. And I think something that David mentioned, it totally resonates with me of finding champions and, and empowering them to do good work. Because as we know, and as it has been mentioned, there's only typically one or two or three of us within city government or our organizations. So the more that people advocate for sustainability when we're not there, the more progress we'll see throughout our community. So that's really what we want is empowering people in order to speak up and bring up sustainability during a planning event so that Kevin or Lauren or Slutsy or I, you know, don't need to be at every meeting to advocate for these things. Um, one key element was there was an energy action plan that was passed and adopted in 2016 by city council. Soon after that, the comprehensive plan was passed by city council as well and referenced the sustainability outcomes in the energy action plan and said these greenhouse gas emission goals should be met. Um, and, it, and included a few other things in the comp plan that, around the topic of sustainability. Um, one of the key things in this is that it kind of informed a pathway for public transit investment um, and said if we wanna really densify certain corridors in the city, that's where our transit lines and our transit investment should be allocated to so that we're adding or more people are living by um, high amenity, high frequency transit. Um, soon after that, our transit update, our transit transportation plan was passed um, also by the city council. Uh, it's kind of a downtown mobility plan and then also started some micro mobility investments. And by that, I mean, car sharing, bike sharing, scooter sharing programs have kind of just gotten their legs underneath them here in the city. Um, and they're being pretty widely used, which is fun to watch. Uh, I think in a three month pilot last year, we had over 60,000 rides by 13,000 unique riders um, covering about 60,000 miles. So uh, I think we found something that the community loves, which is good. And not everybody loves it, but some people do, right? I mean, scooters are kind of a, sticky topic. Um, but out of these two planning efforts, then RPU updated their infrastructure plan. Uh, we have a municipal electric utility here in the city 
and they adopted and uh, or suggested that the city and their they should move towards a 100% renewable plan by 2030 and are starting to put things in place uh, in order to meet that goal. They're working on a 10 megawatt solar facility to um, add to their electric mix this year. So it's under construction, should be open um, 2022 is my understanding. And then there's also some district energy planning that's happening downtown as well. So starting to electrify the heating and cooling needs of facilities so that uh, we're transitioning off carbon-based fuels. So those are kind of at the high level, right? We have the comp plan, transportation, now power and utility planning, and now we're trying to realize some of these same outcomes on a development standpoint. So we have a couple of sustainable building policies. One is for DMC funds, so projects requesting DMC funds, we have some sustainability requirements tied to them. And same with city TIF, so tax increment financing. Um, so those are requirements that these facilities need to integrate, and they're kind of based largely on the St. Paul building policy, if folks are familiar with that which is pretty heavily based on LEED, the Leadership in Energy Environmental Design, if folks are familiar with that rating system. On top of that, there also has been some zoning uh, regulations passed by city council that promote zoning along these transit corridors. So transit-oriented development zoning and then R2X zoning is allowing for more density along corridors in the city that have transit now and will continue to have investments in transit into the future. And so again, we're starting to... Sorry, a little minute. bit less than a minute. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll hurry up, yeah. Um, which is super important because we want more people living by transit in order to make sure that those investments in the community are effective. And then finally, on existing buildings, is kind of this final nut to crack for us, is we have a voluntary benchmarking program we created a couple years ago, and we're, we have goals every year to try to add new buildings to participate. And it's voluntary, they don't need to, so it's kind of a lot of hand-holding and also understanding of why it's important to look at your utility bills and what the benefits of those things are. And then working on kind of combined efficiency program targets. So I, super quick, there's a lot of work going on and I kind of barely scratched the surface of things. I put together, or Lauren put together the slide deck and shared it with city council a couple weeks ago. So it includes a lot of different activities from a policy standpoint an organizational standpoint. So Lauren leads a green team within the city organization that has about a half a year of meetings under its belt and some pretty exciting things are coming out of that work. And then there's some community led efforts too. probably the most exciting one out of this that is a air quality monitoring program and projects. So we're installing 15 air quality monitors throughout the city to better understand are there kind of microclimates of pollutants that we should be more mindful of and figure out how we can leverage that data to make better decisions around sustainability and equity moving forward. So I'll stop there. I feel like I talked a lot, but happy to answer questions too. Fabulous, thank you. So um, we would now be entering the phase when we would be answering questions. And I see that some have come by in the chat. Um, and I'm not quite sure if Maggie or Alyssa is gonna share the questions. Well, uh, maybe we could start, Chris. Um, so several folks mentioned Pi, um, and there were some questions about Pi. Dave Womberg, maybe you could just explain to folks what Pi is for those who are less familiar. Sure. Uh, Pi is Partners in Energy through Excel Energy. So if you're in the, um, if Excel Energy is your service provider, you can apply for that program. I think it's a great program. If you're not in their service area, I would still say contact your energy providers because there's other opportunities. But the um, program really does a great job of helping keep you on track. They, they, they don't write a plan for you, but they help facilitate the development of a plan. In Faribault, we came up with our energy action plan. I see Rochester's one and a half percent savings. We, we looked at you know one percent um, as something that would be uh, reasonable in Faribault. Um, but it's a great program um, and I think the program also helps with a lot of things. CERTs helped us, you know, through the program as well as CEE um, to do things like business blitzes and energy breakfasts and a whole lot of things to get people involved in energy savings. That's a quick overview. Beth or Melissa, anything you wanted to add about your experience in the program? Go ahead, Beth. I'd just said they've been really helpful. Um, they they do an excellent job, at least our 
contacts um, with project management and they've been able to help do a lot of like marketing design so there's the graphic folks and things behind the scenes which is taking a load off of our communication staff um, and they don't charge for this so this is a free service that well they you know they make it up somewhere but <laughs> you don't have to pay a consultant fee to them so Red Wing participated in the Partners for Energy program back in 2014-15. Um, and this last year or two, we haven't been participating, but that is something that is incorporated into our climate action work plan. So we will be looking to, to continue on with that. Yeah, and I think, you know, what, what can be tricky, and um, I see several different Rochester faces on my little dashboard, so you can all roll your eyes right now. Um, but I think it's hard when you're not part of the Excel Energy <laughs> Program territory, because then, of course, all these Excel communities are talking about how great the program is, and then you're like, well, great, but I'm not. Um, and I think that there are lots of other ways that people have sort of looked to pull together those kinds of resources and do that kind of integration. But it is, I mean, for those of you who are Excel communities, yes, Ray, go ahead. I was just going to say, if there is a document that lays out this program, it would be interesting to share it, and we can certainly uh, besiege RPU with the uh, with the written material if it exists. Yeah, and I think that they've had some nice, I mean, a number of different folks have had different approaches that you've made, but I think that there are some templates, so that's something that we could certainly look into. Um, there were some other questions in here. Um, I'll say that, <laughs> that one of them was around, um, how did you think about the timelines? And so Melissa, you started to answer this, you know, but Chris was asking, okay, so some folks have this 20 year plan. You talked about a five year plan. Talk a little bit more about that and then I'm gonna have some follow up questions for some other speakers. Go ahead. Yep, so uh, Red Wing opted for a five year climate action, what we call work plan. Um, and so we had just come off, you know, adopting a comprehensive plan that was two years in the making, included, or included a lot of community outreach. Um, and so there just wasn't really an appetite for that. So Great Plains Institute uh, just unveiled uh, these new work plans and uh, it just was a good fit for us. And so it's for 2020 through 2025 and it aims to reduce emissions, uh, community-wide emissions by 9% and then coupled with Excel's changing of the power grid and um, you know, uh, energy code. Uh, updates by 21%. So it's going to kind of, you know, it lays the groundwork for Red Wing for the next five years. So then we can, you know, kind of build that momentum and go from there. Yeah, no, I, and I think that that's really interesting. I mean, Beth, you've talked about it, your climate plan is a longer term plan, but then you mentioned the sort of three year time plan for the strategic plan. Say a little bit more about sort of why longer or shorter, sort of building on Melissa's comment. Yeah, so the strategic plan, the city, this is our first strategic plan that the city's had. We do have a comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2008. Um, and we've actually been talking about updating it. Um, and so the strategic plan is really intended to be a very short time frame focused piece. Um, I'm not sure because I came in kind of midway through the process. I guess I'm not really sure what the background conversations were about long, short. Uh, but if you come to my session, we can talk more about that. Um, <laughs> um, and I have I have big spins other way, but we do have within our larger plan there are some sort of three year like these are the things we want to start to move right away. And we do recognize in the plan that there will be updates periodically, um, just because technology is going to change and all kinds of things are going to change. Yeah. And Kevin, there's some questions here specifically about the transportation plan. Um, there were some questions about the, the targets and goals and framework, but maybe even help me think about, you know, you've talked about building blocks and sort of how do the timelines for the different building blocks sync up as well? Sure. So the, the comp plan kind of came first. Well, actually, the energy action plan kind of came first and it had some prioritization in there, or at least priorities identified as related to transportation. Followed from there was the comp plan. So this is how we want development to happen in our city and where we want development to occur. And then after that, the transportation fo plan followed that said, okay, now that we know where the future for development stands in Rochester, this is how our transit system can be set up to best accommodate that growth that we're expecting in our community. 
Um, so predominantly the goals in the transportation plan focus on uh, reduction of single occupied vehicle rates. So in 2015, we had about 70, 71% of our community members riding a single occupied vehicle to work every day. Uh, the goal of the plan at the highest level is to get that down to 43% by 2035. Um, so we're kind of right in the thick of preparing a, a letter to the Federal Transit Authority to help us build out um, a circulator, a downtown circulator that'll help capture some of the traffic and not have it come into downtown because we don't, we're trying to shift away from being an employee kind of focused congestion to more of like, if there is congestion, let's have it be people visiting downtown, visitors, um, that kind of thing, uh, and get out of the car storage market, which uh, for a lot of time downtown is done well and kind of designed well to accommodate. Um, so at the highest level, that's it. And there's a lot more detail I could share if needed. No, and I appreciate the links that people are putting in here too. I, I wonder if you might each, um, I mean, you've all talked about some different planning elements and engagement. And Dave, I think you kicked us off really well talking about, you know, this sort of shared awareness and sort of building that momentum. So say a little bit about how you felt planning allowed you to invite people in and into that process. Sure, well, I, I will emphasize again, I think if you look at the success of any planning project, one of the, the keys is again, having shared awareness and understanding and, and really involving a broad base of the community in the planning process. That does take a lot of effort. Um, and that is one of the challenges, um, especially if you have uh, little staff. And as Kevin mentioned, the more you can champion others in the community to help you with that and empower, I think that's incredibly important. When we adopted our energy action plan, for example, I, chose, I specifically did not present that to the council. I had others in the community come up. We had um, like, uh, you know, top people in industries and others that came up and said, here's why we support this plan. This is what we're doing in ours. And this is why we think the city needs to be involved with it. But all the way through it, whether it's, uh, meetings in the box, you know, with neighborhoods, the night to unite opportunities to discuss, just getting these discussions is, is incredibly important. And that's how we're getting things done. So I just would emphasize it's, it's one of the most important things to the success, success of planning. And building on that, Melissa, you know, I know that you all in your planning process, I mean, that was engagement was the thing that people were really lauding, right? I mean, you did a lot of different kinds of things. Can you speak to that a little bit more and maybe about how you're thinking about it now in this COVID moment about what engagement might look like That's here on out? <laughs> um, well, so that the, the comprehensive plan and that two years of community engagement, that really was prior to, to me. So I can't really speak too much to that other than, you know, I mean, the, the community engagement specialist uh, made a point of going out and doing like the night to unite, um, we have like a uh, River City Days Festival every year, stuff like that. Um, what engagement's going to look like moving forward, I think that's going to be really interesting and I'd really like to hear from other people what, you know, their thoughts are. Um, just because with our Climate Action Work Plan, one of the, the issues that we've had is that it was pretty much developed right around, you know, the last six months when COVID has been taking place. So we haven't been able to, to go out and really engage with the public and, and promote the plan yet. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a challenge. Anybody wanna share a quick thought about brainstorms you've had about this future engagement moment? Go ahead, Beth. Um, we've done a few webinars and uh, though um, with the help of the partners and energy folks, but um, while they haven't been hugely attended, uh, they were well attended, well enough that like, if we had done this as, a, as an in-person meeting, I would have been happy with it. And the nice thing about those is that we can put the recordings on our YouTube channel so people can, people can watch them later. Um, I'm trying to start working now and thinking about how, so our library has done a fantastic job of still trying to offer programming online. They're doing online story time and things like that. And so I'm trying to think about like ways to kind of get their support and help because people pay attention to the library's webpage and what they're offering. And so if we can start to partner with them a little bit more. Um, yeah, we had planned to do a whole bunch of in-person festival-y stuff this year. And, 
And I think it's been long enough now, you know, to sort of like, all right, how long is this going to last? Like, oh, we'll be able to do that by September. Okay, well, maybe now we really need to like start. So that's on my long to do list of like, all right, let's really start this mm -hmm. assume virtual. Yeah. Thanks. Kevin, go ahead. Um, one other kind of tactic we've been using um, that's had some success is working with community organizations that reach sections of the community that historically have been underrepresented in decision making. So the Olmstead Public Health um, has a community health needs assessment that they update every three years. They've been super helpful. There's a diversity council nonprofit here in town. Um, and what they do or what they've helped with is they have trusted relationships with um, uh, immig new immig immigrant groups to the community, communities of color and black and in indigenous communities here in Rochester. Um, so it's kind of a trusted way to collaborate with these immediate groups to then get introduced introduce to these community leaders of different pockets across the community to then help inform the planning, the planning that we're working through. Um, we're also compensating people for their time, uh, which is kind of a new strategy for the city saying everyone has a kind of engagement fatigue. Uh, as you saw, there's been a lot of planning efforts over the past five years, so it's understandable why that might be the case. Uh, but um, offering stipends uh, to get this input and then also share it back with them after the fact have been particularly helpful um, and is starting to kind of wrap our arms around the community and bring it closer together. Yeah, I love that. Um, Kevin, before we um, transition to a quick break, I also just want to ask you the question that Vicky O'Day shared. I'm sorry, everybody. I've been trying to scan all of the, the questions in chat, and I'm sorry, Vicky, I missed this one until now, but um, Vicky asked about um, RPU as the Muni and whether or not RPU is working with other municipal utilities to scale the practices and the 100% renewable power 2030 goal. I think that's the plan. Um what the plan says is trying to build out the infrastructure to meet our needs, city of Rochester's needs moving forward, but some of the plant sizes in order to provide the instantaneous demand that's needed to serve the community during peak uh, energy periods in the summer and sometimes winter uh, will require some partnerships with others in order to build the plants at the right size in order to make sure that we don't have a brownout blackout situation from everyone drawing power so that that's in their thinking. I just don't think we're quite far along enough to know exactly how we're going to go about this. But 2030 is kind of the, the date that we need to have this stuff up and operational um, to make sure our community members have power and can do the things they want to do. Yeah. Well, that theme of partnership keeps coming up. Okay, so everybody, here's the plan. Um, we're gonna take a quick five minute break. This is your chance to, if you have yourself up on video, you can leave that you're on video um, or you can stop your video briefly, but come back within five minutes, okay? And then we're gonna be pushed into breakout groups. You signed up for breakout groups for the phase one and the phase two. But here's the fun thing about Zoom technology. It actually doesn't let you assign people to the second breakout group until the first breakout group is done. So poor Maggie is like, I don't know how we're gonna do that. So what we're gonna do, you're gonna come back in about now four and a half minutes. You're gonna get pushed into your first breakout room. You can just accept it or it'll pull you in. It's like magic. And then you'll be in a smaller group. Please feel free to turn on your video if that's comfortable for you. If not, it's totally okay. But we're gonna have a chance for more conversation. Then you'll get pulled back to this big group. We'll have each of the groups share a little bit about some reflections about what key themes came up and that will buy us a little bit of time for Maggie to put us into the second breakout group. Then we'll do that and then we'll come for the close. Okay, so you are now officially on break. Be back in four minutes. Maggie, I can see people coming back. Um, so you're just gonna push the magic. I was like, who, who was describing it as Hogwarts? Was, was that Beth? I think like so. Yes, there is a magic school. button that I have the power to touch that says open all rooms. Okay. And at that point, everyone goes and all they right. may have to remember to, after they're in their small group, unmute themselves yes. and perhaps start your video. But okay. um, that is what this magic button tells me it will do. All right, let's do it. I mean, some okay. people will come back and they'll be like, oh my gosh, there are fewer people. What happened? And then they'll realize okay. they're here we go.
Did anybody actually do a countdown or did you? No. Nobody got cut off right in the middle. Dave Womberg was like, last sentence thought, and then we, and here we are. Mm -hmm. Well done. Um, so I want to just open it up for folks in some of the other groups. Were there some key themes that you heard people sort of digging into or questions? Go ahead, Matt. Um, yeah, so equity was our topic, and uh, we got a really good presentation from Rochester on a mapping system for saying who are the people who really have a voice, who are the people who have needs, um, and that was helpful. We talked a lot, a lot about getting it in the planning process, um, and then the <laughs> next step, which can be the harder one, of actually um, implementing and getting things going. Yeah. And both involve stakeholders really being involved. And the, the latter is a harder thing to get stakeholders um, for governments to reach out successfully. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Other themes, comments from folks? We talked about green teams in our session and the various ways that um, cities organize them and how sometimes it's uh, kind of derived from the, the uh, planning commission. I think that's how Fairbo is organizing theirs. Sometimes they're appointed directly and uh, the idea of possibly having it be uh, if they have a parks commission, which made a lot of sense to me. That's interesting. You know, we were at the very end of our session. Um, Lauren was talking a little bit about um, sort of power mapping and, and sort of trying to identify people from key different sectors. And, and I think that relates, Matt, both to what you were describing, sometimes in sectors that get missed, right? But also, I think, Chris, to your point, sort of thinking about if you're assembling that sort of team, being intentional about really bringing folks in who you know are going to then connect to other parts of the network seems really, really important. Other thoughts from folks? Hey, it's Peter Lindstrom. Hello, hello. I, I can chime in that uh, we were talking about the climate action plan in the city of Red Wing. And uh, the things that we talked about uh, were things like why they um, decided to hire a consultant to help them complete that plan and it definitely added capacity um, and expertise to the plan which they found very helpful and then we <clears throat> chatted about some of the barriers to getting uh, the plan in place um, including funding number one that seemed to be the the number one barrier and then uh, some other barriers that came up including um, uh, just educating the community about why this is important to have a climate action plan in the first place. And uh, of course, the next step for, for Red Wing is implementation and uh, getting it off the ground and, and doing the work. Yeah, and, and maybe others would have a, a comment about this. This came up in our group. Um, you were talking about sort of, and how do you get the resources to do the work? And, and there was a question in our group about, well, people, you know, especially in moments when people are feeling fearful or there are pain points, um, how do you get people to think about sustainability work or um, resilience work? And then Vicki introduced the term regenerative work as sort of the priority. And I think, you know, Dave Womberg, you said the yes and approach, right? So that people are, it's not sort of a reductionist sort of one, my, pie, my piece of pie takes away from your piece of pie, but how do we grow a bigger pie? And I don't know, Dave, if you want to comment any more about that or if other people wanted to chime in about how do you, how do you make a sort of shared space? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I do think that um, we tend to do a lot of yes buts and wherever we can do yes and and find commonalities and celebrate those commonalities. I think that's um, incredibly helpful to do. I do think it takes some time and effort to get to that point. And I do think it, it isn't, I mean, there's times where you have to do battle, right? I mean, we all believe in that, um, you, that you have to stand for something. 
um, and you don't put up with certain types of things, you know, I mean, that, that are, are, you know, terrible things, essentially, that, and, and a lot of that goes in in politics. But there's other times where you have to just be a little understanding and realize it takes some time and that you continue to work through those and you celebrate your commonalities and you try to keep moving forward. Um, just some quick thoughts on it. I can expand later too, if you'd like. Go ahead, Beth. Uh, I would say look for the sales. You know, like um, we stumbled upon the uh, fleet study effort that Excel was just launching that we could get that done for free. Um, so great. Like, and, and timing wise, I was like, oh, I've got these other things going on, but you know what, we're gonna jump on this now because the money's there. Um, and being able to show your council like, okay, so I brought in $3,000 from certs and this has this value and I brought this in and this has this value. And you know what, if you give me another year, I'll show you the actual energy savings because we've never looked at that. And we just say, oh, add 3% to the budget and go on. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the like showing the value of the work um, is a way to try to help. Um, Maggie, give me a head nod. How are you doing? Are you almost ready? Close? Almost ready. And then what we can do is the system will open up. Um, I can move people. I can continue moving people. So if at okay. first you're like, what's going on? Just, you know, try to be okay. patient and then you'll yeah, be yeah. Voop, magically, you know, zoomed into another room. So, okay. um, so why don't I'm going to say one last thing and then why don't you go ahead and, and start moving us. I will say, Beth, the comments that you were just making um, reminded me when I was thinking about um, the story that Chris wrote up about Farabo, actually. <laughs> Dave, I feel like you guys have taken advantage of perhaps every single program made available by any potential partner. Um, and you mentioned partnering a lot. And I guess I just I want to sort of affirm that, that like sometimes there's an open window, right? All of a sudden there's this opportunity and it's like, okay, let's, let's run at that because it is that sort of a, alignment of resources. So Dave, why don't you briefly comment? And yeah, no, that's that really minute. important. There are so many programs, CERT, CEE, I mean, it goes on and on. There's just, and I would say in a community where we don't have staff dedicated, um, you know, specifically to this topic, it's incredibly important that we do that, that partnering. And it's really, really helpful for us because they have expertise in other areas. It's been wonderful. So I would really urge you to do that. And I'm happy to discuss opportunities with others offline too. Yeah, thanks Dave. Okay, friends, here we go. We're gonna go into our next breakout room and then we'll be back together to wrap up. A little like an out-of-body experience. Um, I, I wanna say thank you. I, Chris, do you have any closing words that you wanted to add or Kristen? Oh, I, you know, one of my main goals with this event was really to help us all network. And I'm delighted that you were willing to take this time with us. And I'm so proud of um, the Green Step cities and the cities in Minnesota and all the fabulous work that you're doing. So thanks for coming this morning. I'm simply echoing that. Do keep an eye out. We'll, we'll be scheduling some um, new workshops for this coming school year um so in the next couple of months um if you have any topics that you really want to dive into deep let me know and um, we can get some speakers and similar um workshops set up yeah and many many thanks to david and melissa and beth and kevin for leading the charge both in presenting you all did a fabulous job and facilitating your breakout rooms um thank you thank you thank you thank you and maggie well done on technology, way to be able to adapt on the fly there. Um, and honestly, everybody, I know that there are so many Zoom meetings and Dave, you sort of referenced this, but we are grateful that you were here and thank you for being active participants in all of the breakout sessions. That is actually what makes all of this work and having your questions and your thoughts and you know creativity and chiming in on you know sort of your approach and ways you've done it has been fantastic. So. Thanks everyone. We will be sending out some notes. Kristen put a link in earlier, but we'll send out also to the folks that registered as well as that through Green Step and through CERT. So many, many chances to see both the PDFs as well as the recordings. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.